Hello plant lovers, it is Matthew in Melbourne welcoming you to my channel. Thank you very much for finding me. And if you're new here, I grow cold, cool, intermediate orchids here in Melbourne, Australia, without any grow lights or greenhouses or humidifiers or any equipment, just really me, them, inside or outside or not at all. So plant lovers, if that sounds like your type of growing conditions, do hit subscribe and follow my continuing amateur adventure. Uh, and I post every Friday. And this week's video, plant lovers, is actually not about this fabulous orchid that is before us. It's about something quite mundane, but weirdly, I was going to use this plant as a demonstration, and we'll get to that in a minute, and then I just noticed it's absolutely covered in flowers. Now, I have made a care video about this orchid before, when I had one flower well, one sort of flowering spike, and I was so excited about it. It's called Isochylus linearis, that's the tag, and it is a South American orchid with a pretty wide distribution, but it is a high elevation orchid, which grows in quite uh, damp, misty forests. As you can see, it kind of looks more like grass than an orchid and has no pseudobulbs. So it's one of those orchids that does not want to dry out likes to be on the shadier and the cooler side and kept moist. And then at the end of each of these very grass-like spikes, you get this cluster of the most extraordinary magenta flowers, which is just stunning, isn't it? Look at all of them. So imagine when you get a really big specimen and it's just a cascade of magenta flowers. I cannot wait. I'm very, very excited. And mine is doing very well. So obviously the more growth you get every year, the more chance you get like this for multiple blooms. Of course, the bigger the rhizome gets, the more canes it gets, the more flowering opportunities you get. So I've probably had this now for three years and it was relatively small. And as I said, I've had one or two flowers, but wow. Anyway, and it's also late autumn um, and this is covered in blooms, but it can actually flower at any point in the year. So it doesn't really have a flowering season, nor does it have a rest period. So yeah, keep it moist all the time. But anyway, the real point of this video was actually about the pot. Because yes, plant lovers, I made a video a while back about repotting a beautiful miltasia of mine called Lavender Kiss, Lavender Taffy, and it was a beast of a thing. And I wanted a large pot with holes in it for aeration, but I couldn't find one, so I drilled one. Few people have asked me about drilling, and I thought, you know what, I should actually just make a standalone video about how I went about drilling those pots, because it sounds more off-putting than it is, but it's super simple, and then incredibly cost-effective to give you beautiful pots. So, plant lovers, this is a how do you make your own holy terracotta orchid pot video 101. Let us though start at the very beginning with orchids in general. Now, of course, it's the largest flowering group of plants on earth. There are many, I was gonna say millions, maybe there are, so many different species of orchids growing in so many different environments. It's really impossible to generalize. However, let's generalize. <laughs> A lot of the orchids that you're gonna grow in cultivation, the species ancestors were essentially epiphytes, which means they live on or in trees, branches, nooks, etc., where they gain all their nutrients and moisture and sustenance. Now, some epiphytes actually live in collected matter in sort of forks of trees, of branches near the root base of trees. Others literally cling to the side of a branch and have no matter and they cling and they sort of climb up a bit like a phalaenopsis, for example. So either way though, those sorts of orchids, as you can imagine, generally have lots of air movement because they're in the wild and they're often a bit elevated in trees, but those roots are not contained in a pot nor are they underground. So the roots are often very, very aerated as well because they're not immersed in a potting medium or a soil. So to grow your orchids in the best way possible as an indoor-outdoor grower, you've got to try and replicate the conditions that those orchids like as much as you can. Now, I often joke that I'm a terracotta pot kind of guy because quite simply, I just like the aesthetics of terracotta and I'm trying to move away from plastic. So obviously you can use plastic pots and that is so much, perhaps I will say easier. Obviously they're lighter, they're cheaper and very easy to pierce holes in if you want to do that. You can also use transparent plastic so you can see the root system. I really don't like that, so I always choose terracotta. Now, here is an amazing Oncidium 
Look at this. Isn't that the most beautiful thing? And it has the most beautiful fragrance. Now I bought it in bloom, so I'm not gonna take any credit for the flowers, but it's standing in this rather lovely white uh, porcelain javanier. But if we look at the plant, as you can see, it's in a black plastic pot. And as you can also see, very vigorous pseudobulbs with very vigorous roots. So once this plant has finished its amazing flowering, I'm going to need to repot it. Look, they're, they're trying to make friends. <laughs> the fragrance is just beautiful. So generally when you get an orchid, it's going to be in plastic and that is totally okay. And you might want to keep it in plastic for the rest of your growing journey. And that is also okay. You should probably switch off now because this is not about growing orchids in plastic. <laughs> so the thing is with terracotta, it evaporates faster than plastic. So that can be a good thing for growing orchids because it means the medium that you've got your orchids in is not going to stay soggy. So particularly in warm weather, it will dry out and aerate really quickly. The negative of that though is obviously in warmer weather, your orchid in the soil might dry out too quickly. And so for example, this one, which doesn't want to dry out, means in summer or in warmer weather, when it's in terracotta, it's probably gonna need watering at least every day or a checking on its moisture levels every day. So that's the negative. Also terracotta is more expensive and it's heavier and it can break. However, we've done the whole aesthetic journey. So if you go and buy your regular terracotta pots, that is what it looks like and they are not very expensive and you can get them really anywhere, any hardware store will have terracotta. You can also get, and there's quite a market in it, vintage terracotta, which just has more patination and sometimes moss, which I think is really beautiful. Can be wildly expensive, but anyway, you often see them in sort of French shabby chic provincial garden shops were covered in moss for a fortune. Anyway, your own terracotta pot will eventually weather up. So you might not want to go down that path. That's your basic terracotta pot. You can also buy here in Australia, and I'm not sure if you could probably, I imagine in the States and in Europe, these pots, which are cast with this sort of slit-like aperture all the way around. And actually this one's still got the price tag on, $7.95 Australian. So that is actually not um, a useless orchid pot. It's actually really fantastic. The only thing is, for me, firstly, there's not enough apertures around it, and I kind of just don't like the slits. It's, again, an aesthetic thing. But anyway, these are ready buyable, but here in Australia, there are only two sizes, this size and a slightly large one, and that's it. No other pots do you find in sort of regular commerce with the, um, the apertures in the pot already made. And this plant here, my Isochylus, as you can see, is growing in such a pot. There we are, and there's the, the slits through there. Um, so it's great, so it allows air to some degree through, it also allows it to drain more readily and gives it a vague sort of, um, an exact version of how it was growing in the wild. Just look at those flowers, isn't it amazing? The magenta against the green, ah, oh, love, love, love. Anyway, so that was my beginning of my pierced pot orchid journey. Now, many moons ago, I was very, very fortunate to go to Brazil uh, for a friend's wedding, which was wonderful. And I traveled quite extensively throughout the country and was in Rio and went to the Botanic Garden there, which is amazing. And they have an incredible orchid house. And I noticed that the orchids were all in these beautiful pots with multiple holes, not dissimilar to this. Part of the joy was just, I don't know, there's just something very satisfying about seeing, particularly cat layers, you know, with all the roots and these beautiful flowers growing out of pots like this. It always seems to me very sort of 19th century orchid specialisty. Anyway, I just love the aesthetic and I loved the orchid house in the Rio Botanic Gardens and it's always stuck with me, that image of those pierced pots with orchids. Anyway, a couple of years ago, I, I often Google terracotta orchid pot, just, you know, just to see what's gonna happen, usually, what shows up is these, but this particular day, these popped up from a nursery, well, not really nursery, actually a garden supply company here in Melbourne. I was just over the moon, quite a way away from here. So I rang them up, yes, they still had them, but not many. So I drove out and there was a little table just piled with them. There was probably about 10 altogether, this size and a larger size. So it turned out that these were manufactured in Vietnam. And towards the end of COVID, when we were actually allowed out, I was able to drive out to this um, place and ask him about them. Anyway, there was about 10 left and 
I said, oh, great, you know, you'll be getting more. No, he says. So firstly, I bought everything. And secondly, the reason being that COVID had so disrupted the Vietnamese supply chain and manufacturing. And these he got from a small family maker that he used to go out to Vietnam to buy from who had basically gone out of business during COVID. So that was the end of his supply. Anyway, I uh, cried myself to the checkout buying everything that he had left. But of course, I've generally used most of them. The reason I have this one is that this did have a dendrobium in it, which is no longer with us. You know what, plant lovers, things happen. So that left me with a very real psychodrama of, I want pots like the ones I saw in the Rio Botanic Garden. Mm -hmm. Enter stage left, a hand drill and a terracotta pot and you do it yourself. Now, a few viewers had said, Matthew, drill your own pots, it's really simple. Watch all the YouTube videos. And I thought, yeah, okay. Um, in the end, I decided, look, I need to do it. So I went to my local hardware store and I found an older person. I hate to say it, but I do tend to think <laughs> you always gravitate to someone older because you think they've got more wisdom anyway. And I asked him what I should do. And he said, well, firstly, you need, which I sort of knew anyway, diamond tipped drill bits. So can you see those there? And you actually probably see, well, you can see the remains of terracotta but you can see the diamonds glistening. Anyway, so that's the first thing you need. Well, actually it's not. The first thing you need is a drill. Now, what I'm gonna do is show you the footage of me actually drilling these pots. So the first thing you need is a drill and it's safer, I think, to have a cordless drill because one of the things you need when you're drilling these pots is to have water running over the pot because the heat generated by the drill is quite intense and it will burn and crack the pot. So you need to have water running over the pot while you're drilling it and you can see me doing that here. So just for safety reasons, not having a power cord running out to a socket is probably a very good idea. So get yourself a cordless drill. So then the next thing is obviously the drill bit. So you need a diamond tipped drill bit like that. And then here's the second one. There you go. Now, logically, as you can see, the diamond's glistening. The size of the drill bit determines the size of the hole in your pot, smaller, larger. And in fact, I got two, a sort of a, a small and a large, but in fact, there were many, many, many options going from even smaller to even larger. So depends on the size of pots and the type of orchids you're growing, you'll find a diamond tipped drill bit to suit your needs. So it is very simple to put that in your drill. You just screw the end, you pop it in like that, and you screw it in the other direction, tighten it up, ta-da, there you go. Now, the next cunning piece of advice, which I would never have figured out, was the surface of your pot is curved and your drill bit is flat. So you're going to get, it's gonna be impossible to get a grip on that curved surface. So one of the things that my older colleague at the hardware store suggested I do was get an old credit card or plastic card or store card and actually the first thing you do is use your drill bits and drill a hole through your card. Now I'm using an old cinema card. Remember the days when you used to go to cinemas? This is the Nova Cinema in Melbourne, great independent cinema. Alas, haven't been there since COVID. So the card takes the drill. So you drill your various sizes through that, or one card per size, depending how many you've got. And this effectively is your template. So the next thing you do is when you're drilling, you put your card over the spot where you want to drill, hold it down with your hand, as you can see me doing there. And then when you go to drill, you kind of got a guide for the drill bit so that the drill isn't gonna bounce off the curved surface. Genius, how simple is that? Now, you are gonna get quite messy doing this because you need running water and then you get a lot of dust, terracotta colored dust from your terracotta pot. So bear that in mind, wear old clothes and do it outside somewhere where you can have all that sort of dirty runoff. So a driveway or a path or the lawn or somewhere outside. I did mine out on our deck and I did it in warm weather because running water, you get kind of wet and it's nicer to do it when it's warm. So there's a spring summer task for you. Now, if you are the handy sort and you've actually got a workbench with clamps, then the 
easiest thing to do is of course clamp your pot on your workbench and go like that. But of course, it depends if you can get water around it. Now I don't have a workbench with clamps, so I clamped the pot between my knees, as you can see. Now, you would imagine, hmm, Matthew, that's quite dangerous. But actually, these drill bits are not that sharp. They're not gonna hurt you. Whereas if you're drilling with a regular drill and it bounces and goes into your hand or your leg, you could <laughs> drill a hole in yourself. However, be cautious, but ultimately they're relatively safe. And if it does slip and, and catches your hand or your knee, it's not going to hurt. So bear that in mind. I used my knee and then I also found it quite easy to manipulate keeping the hose pipe in place, keeping the card in place and drilling at the same time. You kind of need three hands to do that, which is why if you had a bench with a clamp, it might be a lot easier keeping the pot still. So you only had to focus on the water and the drilling. And then finally, yes, you get very, very wet and dirty. So bear that in mind, as I said. And here is the result of one of my drilling. So this is a smaller pot. I just did a few holes around there. And this is for a Holker Gossam uh, Vandercross, which um, I made a video about as well. Now, I could have actually put more holes in this one if I wanted to. I guess the thing is you've got to be wary of the sort of intrinsic strength of the structure of your pot. Too many holes, it's of course just going to break. So space them out reasonably. But if you look at this one, this has a lot of holes. But this one has been cast that way, whereas I have been drilling this madly. Um, so there you are, plant lovers. How to drill your own pots in one easy step, is it one? Well, anyway, a few easy steps with Matthew. There you go. Very rewarding. It means you can drill anything from huge to large. If you need something wide and flat for an orchid that is shallow rooted but spreads, you can do that. You can use pans, you could use more decorative porcelain. You can still drill with your diamond tip point if you've got a, a fancier pot. The world is your oyster when it comes to drilling pots. There we are, plant lovers from Isochitis linearis and my fabulously pierced pots. That is me wrapping up for this week. Isn't it beautiful? I'm so excited about this. I cannot believe that I hadn't noticed it. I literally went out this morning and there's all these blobs of magenta. It just sprung on me. I guess the other point to make is you can see an old flower spike there. Uh, is that it won't flower again from a spike that has already bloomed like this. So the name of the game is getting vegetative growth every season, well actually throughout the year because it grows all the time. The more canes you get, the more flowering opportunity you get, so bear that in mind. But anyway, a beautiful, beautiful plant. Well, plant lovers, I hope that has been of some use. I had embedded the drilling footage in a few other videos, but I thought let's just put it all together so that anyone who's interested can find it. Thank you very much for watching my DIY pot drilling episode. I very much look forward to seeing you next week. I post every week on a Friday, so hit subscribe if you want to know what my continuing adventure might be, and I look forward to seeing you next week.